Hi everyone. Uh, hi everyone. We're Science in Australia Gender Equity. I'm Zalika Zavalos and I've got my colleague uh, Rachel Morgan with us uh, co-hosting and also our colleague Suzanne Morden's building your questions on social media. So be sure to send us all your questions through our Google Plus page as well as our Twitter and use the hashtag SagePilot. For a bit of background, Science in Australia Gender Equity is managing the Australian pilot of Athena Swan, which is a gender equity accreditation program that's had a lot of success increasing the number of women in senior roles within science. Today we're welcoming Dr. Brian Lloyd, Jackie Costello and Dr. Joanne Flanagan from the UK Atomic Energy Authority who achieved a bronze Athena Swan award in 2015. Our guests are part of their institution self-assessment team, which oversees the data collection and analysis for their Athena Swan application. So institutions that are applying uh, for an Athena Swan award are asked to present data on the composition of their research workforce. Joanne, your institution employs scientists in engineering and nuclear physics, some of the most challenging areas for science in terms of gender equity. When you were presenting your data, you separated your workforce into these two streams. Can you tell us about the thinking behind presenting these data separately? Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> well, ahead of our data analysis, we had some idea that the stories that physics and engineering, respectively, had to tell in terms of women um, would be quite different. Um, there are generally a larger proportion of women in physics in the UK. It, higher and further education is something like 20% for physics, about 15% for engineering. And in the workforce in general, those numbers are again quite different for physics. It's very similar to higher education at about 18%. And engineering, it's more like 6 or 7% um, uh, percentage of women. Uh, in, in engineering and I think that stems from the fact that apprenticeships is a, um, a quite an important route into engineering and women are typically very poorly represented in engineering apprenticeships in the UK um, and so it was it was good that we had this this idea that the stories would probably be quite different because certainly in our preliminary analysis when we looked at our data as a whole the the story that it was telling looked a little strange. It was difficult to piece together what that might mean. Um, when we were looking at, for example, the percentage of women um, as a um, as a function of the uh, the grade uh, sort of seniority, it was quite a complex picture. And it wasn't until we separated out into physics and engineering that we saw something more clearly. We had expected to see um, the typical leaky pipeline where you see a drop in the percentage of women with seniority, um, and we saw something quite different to start off with. And when we separated out the streams, we could see that physics did show that classic leaky pipeline model um, with a sort of 30% women at the uh, intake um, graduate levels, dropping to less than 10% at the more senior levels. Uh, but engineering, although the proportional representation was far lower, had a much, much flatter distribution, almost no leaky pipeline. And that was quite interesting. And it wasn't until we separated out the data that we could see that detail. So it essentially gave us clarity to understand um, the trends. And until we did that, it wasn't possible to start asking questions about why the data was the way it was. Great. And closely related to that on data collection, I think um, as a publicly funded research body, your workforce composition is somewhat different to the higher education sector and you had to work at translating your staffing structure against national benchmarking data. Brian, could you tell us a little bit about how you went about translating your staffing structure in that way and how you benchmarked it against national data? Okay, uh, thank you. That's a very good question. Um, uh, the existing benchmarking data is mainly from academic institutions uh, and we, as you uh, indicated, don't fit the traditional academic model. So we had to be somewhat creative in ob obtaining relevant benchmarking data, which we obtained uh, from a range of sources, including uh, professional engineering and physics bodies. Um, 
We have very close links with the academic institutions though, not only because uh, we host PhD students, but we work together with many of the academics, we collaborate with them. Uh, and so we're, we're fairly familiar with the career structures in the universities and that enabled us to um, easily match our uh, roles um, to typical university career posts in terms of responsibility and accountability and that's outlined in our application uh, on page 10, table 2. Um, we're actually um, in the UK in a transition period because Athena Swan was originally aimed only at academic institutions and now it's aimed at research institutes as well. Our application was in the first full round uh, where research institutes could apply. There had been a pilot study but the first full application uh, period uh, corresponded to our application. So in fact, uh, when you looked at the application, many of the questions, they were still a little bit geared towards academic institutes rather than research institutes. Um, hopefully in future, um, there'll be more benchmarking data from research institutes as more and more research institutes um, get involved. Um, but finally, I'd say that benchmarking is, is, is only one aspect of the analysis and we shouldn't, um, it's very important, but we, we shouldn't um, only focus on that. And what was very important in analyzing our data was understanding the trends within, a, within our own data, the, the sticking points in terms of uh, career uh, development, um, you know, key transition points. And these were, these were very important to identify and deal with. Thank you so much for, for that. So my next question is to Jackie. Your application identified some of the key gender equity challenges that your organisation faces when retaining and promoting women. For example, on page 17, you uh, note that there's been a drop of, in the proportion of women at higher levels for both physics and engineering. What are some of the key actions you've undertaken to respond to these findings? Okay, well the first thing that we um, needed to do was really to understand why we had low representation in some of our grades, in some of our disciplines. Um, it would be very easy to look at the data that we'd gathered and make some assumptions and possibly bring in bias that we might have as to conclude why that would be. So we felt it was very important to speak directly to um, our STEM employees and to find out from them exactly why they um, their careers weren't, weren't progressing, maybe how we would have expected them to to um, be progressing and to get some wider feedback from them as to how they felt about their career progression and any barriers that uh, might be impacting them. So um, we spent quite a lot of time carrying out one-to-one -one sessions with all of our STEM females and gathering a huge amount of data which we, we've we um, analysed most of it. We still have some more work to do on this area. It's, it's, a, it's quite a large area and it's important that we really focus on it and, and get to the bottom of some of the issues. But from looking at the data that we've gathered so far, there are some very clear themes that are coming through um, that we can make use of in terms of finding some actions to tr try to address them. So the main um, thing that's coming through to us is that um, females are tending not to apply, they're not um, putting themselves forward for some of the promotion opportunities internally at a rate that we would expect um, the wider workforce to do. Um, the, and some other themes are that there's a, a lack of awareness in some of our uh, career development and um, promotion processes. Um, there are some perceived or real barriers um, about uh, people taking maternity leave or returning to work on a part-time basis and how that will affect their careers and whether that uh, is something that uh, people should be taking into account. Um, we also feel that there's um, imposter syndrome playing a part in this that's um, preventing people from recognising their skills and, and really um, having the confidence to put themselves forward. So um, based on some of those themes, and there are a number of others as well that I haven't listed today, we've come up with um, some more actions that we want to take forward. Some of those are things like we already have an unconscious bias um, training scheme that we run and we've been rolling that out recently focusing on our managers. We'd like to roll that out more widely so that um, all of our employees recognize their own um, bias and how to overcome that um, and to also build that into we, um, a lot of our processes and practices 
practices just to uh, make sure that every day in all the things that we do we recognize that there is room for for bias and to recognize when that's uh, playing a part um, we are going to be providing some much clearer and um, uh, uh, promotion and career development guidance for our employees so that uh, they do understand how they can have access to those um, processes. We are going to be running some coaching for managers so that they understand how to support part-time employees and to ensure that their careers are still developed um, in a way that we would expect for all employees and that working part-time or having a break in career um, for maternity etc isn't um, something that will hold people back. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, um, uh, and we want to make sure that um, uh, our managers are looking more widely when there are promotion opportunities in the organization and not automatically thinking of possibly the most obvious candidate who might um, be suitable for the position but thinking more widely about others that may not be putting themselves forward but actually might be credible suitable candidates and making sure that they are approached and that they have access to those opportunities even if they thought themselves that they, they weren't within their reach um, and finally we want to make sure that they have uh, better access to some of our um, professional development schemes and our mentoring schemes because at the moment I think also that they're, they're not automatically putting themselves forward for some of those schemes so it, lots of encouragement lots of um, you know initiatives to try and um, overcome some of those obstacles but recognizing that we, we probably haven't got the full picture yet we've still got some work to do Great. So also one of the um, issues you identify in your application um, is the entryway pathways for graduate students who are part funded by your organisation along with apprentices and graduate scheme recruits. So you note some of the challenges you face recruiting new starters in fields that you work in such as engineering and plasma physics. Brian, can you tell us what value you gained from including these groups in your application and what you feel you learnt through that? Yes, um, these groups are very important to us because they represent the main entry routes into our organization. Um, apprentices are, are mainly engineers, but uh, uh, people embarking on our graduate scheme, they're a mix of engineers and physicists. And, and um, we also, as you know, take a lot of PhD students. And looking at, at these groups of people is very important because it helps us uh, understand our ability to, to attract um, good engineers and, and physicists to the organization. And, and secondly, we need to ensure diversity in, in these groups of people for several reasons. Because through recruitment, this is one of our main, uh, if you like, uh, forms of engagement with the wider community, then, um, then uh, having diversity in our recruitment into these positions it, uh, influences how we're viewed externally. Uh, and also, um, because these are the main entry routes, this is the biggest single way that we can influence in the long term um, the diversity of our whole uh, workforce, our whole organization. Um, in terms of PhD students, I should point out that uh, because we're not an academic institution, we, we can't appoint PhD students. So they are recruited directly by the universities. We are usually involved in the recruitment of them, especially if we're, if we're funding them or part funding them. But the final say over the recruitment uh, is with the universities. And, and so the, we have limited access to recruitment data of PhD students because that lies uh, mainly with the universities. Um, I should point out, however, we are reassured by the fact that uh, almost all the universities we deal with, in fact, probably all of them, are, are, are very committed to um, diversity and gender equality, and most of them have Athena Swan Awards already, many of them at the silver level. Um, in terms of uh, these entry routes into the organization, um, uh, we noticed that in terms of, when looking at the data, we noticed that when, when we looked at our recruitment data, that actually the main problem was getting females to apply in the first place. Once they'd applied, uh, the success rate 
was pretty equal between females and males. In fact, if anything, it was slightly higher for females. So the key problem is getting females to apply in the first place. Um, and I should say in that respect, um, we we target specific universities that we collaborate with, that we know uh, develop the right kind of students through the courses they run. Um, we participate in career fairs. And when we send people out to universities and career fairs, often we find we're sending uh, fairly recent recruits, recent graduates, young people, uh, a balanced mixture of males and females, and people who can are enthusiastic and can you know, engage and resonate with the young people in the universities, and, and, and that's very important. We also found it was very effective to put um, staff profiles on our website and ensure there was a, 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 an appropriate mix there of uh, people, both in terms of their roles in the organization, but their gender. And we've done uh, one or two sort of one-off initiatives that have proved, you know, very exciting. One of our young female engineers, Kim K. Valand, um, she made a video called Born to Engineer with a professional company. Uh, I think it was sponsored by one of our professional bodies. And this one recently won an award at the Bristol Film Festival. So this summer, that video is, is going to be projected onto uh, major buildings in one of the major cities in the UK, Bristol. And this is going to, you know, um, hopefully have a great impact on our ability to attract, um, you know, um, high potential young females to the organization. Um, one final thing, a uh, cautionary note I would say is that um, if if you if you use social media, um, you you need to use it with care in terms of recruiting. If 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 you don't uh, target your um, approach in some way, you will get an awful lot of, if you like, um, unsatisfactory or inappropriate applications, and it doesn't automatically in itself lead to an increase in um, the percentage of female applications. Mm. Uh, thank you for that. The idea of using a video and the fact that it's won awards is really interesting. Um, I think um, you've obviously got a multi-pronged approach to gender equity, which is really terrific. Um, and we'll make sure that we'll share that video. Hopefully we can grab a link off you and share it with our viewers as well. The next question is to Joanne. Oh, sorry, Brian. Okay. Um, Joanne, the Athena's One application asks for honesty and self-reflection. One example of this in your application is where you discuss maternity return rate and support for flexible working. Your quantitative findings were quite positive, however your staff culture survey highlighted some of the negative issues as well as some positive experiences. Can you reflect on the role of using qualitative data in highlighting some of, some of these issues? Absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, particularly discussions around um, flexible working and return from uh, maternity or, or paternity, um, they generally have one commonality and that's major life changes. Um, and in these instances in particular, it's the qualitative, qualitative data um, is so important. It paints a far more nuanced picture of um, of what's going on than just who managed to survive a particular situation. It gives you some understanding for the bumps in the road on that journey. Uh, and if you can um, uh, look at the commonalities in those bumps, you can target some and, and help smooth them out. Um, it's a lot of work to collate and analyse this type of data, but in particular instances we have found it to be immensely useful. Um, in the two examples that you're talking about uh, now, I have to say from a personal perspective, a large fraction of that data wasn't a huge surprise to me, I think partially because my experiences from um, two maternity leaves and um, a number of different part-time working patterns are in that data set. Um, but one thing that it did give me was, um, well, it was very empowering to know that there were people with similar experiences to me, that some of the things that I had been struggling with through these life experiences 
weren't necessarily due to failings on my part in the way that I'd handled a particular situation and that maybe the system itself needed a few tweaks and patches. So that was that was very in encouraging to see. Um, and I think from that data, one, one clear issue that um, came out that was that it was really a simple lack of information played a huge role in a lot of the um, dissatisfactions in the in the negative experiences um, lack of information about what was possible uh, about what had been done before with success and about what hadn't worked and it wasn't really until we had that data collectively that we could learn from um, our past experiences um, to share all of the lessons learned uh, as well as the good practices And um, as we've heard before, you've also identified in your organisation a number of activities around how to start to address these issues. So Jackie, can I invite you to speak a little bit more about um, that, particularly the series of actions you've identified to improve flexible work and support those returning from maternity leave. Uh, you mentioned in your report a plan for a full review of flexible working practice policies and procedures and piloting of new processes. So how did you use your findings from the Athena Swan program to negotiate those actions in your action plan with senior executives in particular? Okay, well I think it's important to actually start a little earlier than that in that um, before we embarked on um, the journey towards Athena Swan um, Award, we made sure that we had the buy-in of our senior management and senior staff. Um, this was helped by the fact that at that time there were a lot of messages from some of the research councils that funding was going to be related to um, organisations having uh, at least embarked on the process of uh, obtaining an award. So there was clear a uh, business case um, that supported our desire to go forward for, for um, an award and, and helped us um, with our uh, business case. However, also um, important to note that that, um, our senior management recognised that we were uh, well underrepresented by um, female employees in in our STEM subject in STEM areas, and um, like a lot of organisations, you know, finding it hard to recruit and retain people in those disciplines. So, um, you know, there was as as well as the possible financial implications, there was a very uh, strong business driver for us to to go down this road. And finally, on that particular point, our chief executive officer um, had experience himself when he had a young family of, of working in an organization that provided him with a, a, a large amount of flexibility that enabled him to spend time with his family and he very much uh, appreciated that and you can see that in his letter of support with our Athena Swan Award. So those three things together I think really meant that we had a very compelling business case which Joanne um, sat next to me actually um, put to our um, executives and to our board and, and it, was, it was agreed that this was absolutely the right thing for us to do. So that was very helpful. We knew that we had the, the full backing of, of senior management to go down this road. Um, one of the first things that you, you do is to start gathering your data, etc. And we um, also meant, as part of that, uh, we also contacted and um, announced to our employees that we were, we were going uh, down this journey um, to bring them on board and we had a lot of support from from our employees towards this. I mean some people you know were unsure about it and we have had challenge I wouldn't say we haven't but there was actually a surprising amount of support and so in that process we awakened expectations I think from our employees so that helped to reinforce the, the fact that this was something that we needed to do. Um, the data that we gathered was actually um, very compelling, very powerful and one of the things that um, we knew from um, going for our Athena Swan Award was that our action plan needed to be very much in line with the findings of the data. What they're looking for is to see that we understand what our issues are and that our action plan is appropriate and will match those issues rather than just fabricating nice to do things. We, we needed to ensure that what we did was actually tackling real problems. Um, so again I think it was it was fairly easy to um, have management support at all levels on, on this because it was quite clear that uh, these were the issues that our employees were uh, you know facing and that um, in order for this to be successful we had to tackle those. Um, we've also linked um, our 
action plan, some of the activities on the action plan to our corporate milestones, which um, means that it's very visible and it impacts on um, our employees' bonus payments. And so, therefore, there's a you know it's very visible as a big driver for all of us to get involved. We can see what we need to do. It keeps it live. It keeps it real for us, so that we can all feel that we've played a part in in achieving this. Um, Obviously, we need funding from our senior managers, um, and we need to be able to have time to do these actions. And um, you know, there are negotiations that take place. I think we're lucky in that a lot of the actions that we wanted to put into place really don't cost a huge amount. They may take some time, and some of them have you know financial implications, but um, they really don't take a lot of time. A lot of our actions are really quite simple things that we can do to address things that I've talked about earlier about you know making sure that there's more clarity about uh, career progression and things like that and maybe some coaching. They really don't cost huge amounts of money and um, having them linked very clearly to what is the factual evidence of, of the situation within the organisation has helped us to, to have buy into what we've wanted to do. Great. I might just follow up from there to ask a little bit more about uh, specifically about the flexible work process that you've been going through and the review that you had planned. Obviously, you've had some time to try to implement some of those actions or, or at least begin that review process. Can we ask a little bit about how that's been going and what your experiences have been of trying to undertake this process of review and improve things? Absolutely. Well, the position that we're at, at at the moment is that I've um, carried out quite a lot of research um, and produced uh, a business case for flexibility and um, it covers all the flexibilities that we currently have because we do have flexible working already, um, but it, it expands it in some areas and makes it much clearer to individuals as to you know what they can ask for, what's acceptable, what options there are. That's been sent to all of our department managers and I'm collating data from them, feedback and responses from them, so I'm sure it will um, be actually expanded a little, taking on board some of the feedback, and I've sent it also to our Athena Swan panel, and I've received feedback from them too. So it's in a process of I need to spend time actually working on that and getting it into its final shape, and then we're ready to roll that out to to employees and and start our trial. Thank you so much. Uh, we've got a question from uh, one of our viewers. So Louise Norton from the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute asks, with qualitative data collection, did you encounter focus group fatigue with other programs or projects running simultaneously? And if so, how did you overcome this challenge? We, we can't hear you. <laughs> Um, we're having trouble hearing you. Does somebody else want to take the question? Sorry, can you hear me? Yes, you can. Yes, excellent. Um, would you would you mind repeating the question? I have sure. a few moments to think. <laughs> <laughs> so, with qualitative data collection, did have you experienced focus group fatigue? Uh, if there are other programs or projects running simultaneously, and if so, how did you overcome this challenge? Yeah, I mean. Yeah, like I said before, um, running focus groups and gathering that type of data, it is a lot of work. Um, it's it's some work to get engagement, to get people to sign up to that, although we find, I think with the topics that we've targeted, the people have been very enthusiastic to participate and to share their experiences. Um, the, the main work is behind the scenes in collating the data and running those focus groups and that is a um, that is a big overhead and I think you do have to be very careful about um, specifically picking the things that are most important to focus on and, and not approach overload there. Uh, it's something that we have been aware of, it's something that we have borne in mind when we have, we have run these focus groups. Well, thank you so much to all of our guests 
that was really great and I'm sure very helpful for all of our viewers to hear about your experiences. Um, thank you for sharing your time and insights with us. Just a reminder to our viewers that our guests will be online for the next 15 minutes to answer more of your questions on Google Plus and Twitter, so please send them in with the hashtag SagePilot. If you missed anything from today's discussion, you can watch us again on the Sage YouTube channel. Our next webinar will be on the 23rd of June, and that will be with David Rubain from the Equality Challenge Unit that oversees Athena Swan in the UK. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time.